Good evening, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Wonderful to be with you. What I'd like to do tonight um, is ask for four volunteers. It's not a big book. It's a short book, but it's four chapters. And I need four people with nice, loud voices, one to read each chapter of the book of Ruth. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I've been asked to speak about Jesus in the Old Testament. That's what we're going to do. We did that yesterday. We'll be doing it today. So what I'm going to do now, because some people ask me, <laughs> glad to oblige, I'll pray in English and I'll also pray in Hebrew, okay? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you gratefully and prayerfully. We thank you, Lord God, for the truth of your word. We thank you for the cross, for the blood of your Son, the Messiah, that was shed for us. We thank you for the eternal truth of your word, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. Pour your Spirit upon us, Father God. Open our eyes, our minds, our hearts to the glory and meaning of your word. And more than this, Father, give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also in Jesus' name for Jesus' sake. לא רק לשמוע, אבל גם כן לעשות לפי מה שכתוב בדבריך, בשם ישוע המשיח, אדוננו, גואלנו וצדקתנו, אמן. Good enough for King David, it's good enough for us. Before we turn to the book of Ruth, turn with me please to Matthew's Gospel chapter 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The subject of the genealogies, Luke and Matthew, what they have in common, where they vary, is a huge subject in itself we do not have time for tonight. But let's begin at the beginning. The beginning of the genealogy is not in the New Testament. New Testament gives us Matthew 1.1. Let's begin at Matthew chapter 0, also known as the book of Ruth chapter 1. You cannot understand the genealogies of Jesus, particularly not Matthew, unless you understand it in light of the book of Ruth. But take note, however, in verse 2, Judah was the father of Pettis, and Zera by Tamar, and Pedas was the father of Hezron. Just bear that in mind. But now turn with me, please, to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. I need four nice volunteers with loud, clear voices. David, you'll go first. Read chapter 1, please. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to Jordan in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The man of the name was Imelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Sielon, Epaphrates of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. In Imelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Oprah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chedeon also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws, that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people when giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way 
to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant you that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. They lifted up their voices and wept again, and Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you and turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Therefore, you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, no, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Let's begin with chapter 1, obviously. In chapter 1, and of course we have no chapter divisions in the original Hebrew canon, but we'll, we're reading it that way. The book of Ruth is called the Scroll of Ruth in Hebrew, Hamegila Rut, and it's read ritually in the synagogue today, but in the time of Jesus it was read ritually in the temple. It was read ritually as part of the festal liturgy of what Christians call Pentecost, Hag Shavuot, Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. Hag Shavuot, the day of Pentecost, is the Hebrew Feast of Weeks, okay? Christians call it Pentecost, okay? It ends the Omer, 50 days after Passover. And during the ritual or the liturgy for that day, called the Maxor, they read the book of Ruth the story of a rich and powerful Jewish man who takes a Gentile bride and exalts her. And the story of Ruth gives the beginning of the royal line of King David. It gives the beginning of the royal line of King David, which we know from Matthew is the genealogy of the Messiah. Once again, unsaved Jewish people to this day read this in the synagogue every Pentecost. Every Pentecost, they read it in the synagogue, but they don't know what it means. Who takes this Gentile bride and exalts her? Now, let's understand it further. Ruth is what a theologian would call, at least a believing theologian would call, a corporate solidarity. A corporate solidarity. That's the theological term. A corporate solidarity is where one person represents a larger group of people. Naomi represents the character, the psyche of the Jewish people. You've seen the Broadway musical, Fiddler on the Roof. Chosen people, oi, why didn't you choose somebody else? <laughs> Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Naomi means pleasant. Naomi. Call me Mera, which means bitter. Remember in the Exodus, 
they came to the waters of Merah. The name Miriam, Mary, means bitter. Simeon's prophecy to the mother of Jesus. A sword will pierce your own heart. Mary, call me Mary. Don't call me, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mary. God is against me. God has put his hand against me. I lost my husband. I lost my children. I lost everything. I have nothing. Now I've come back to this land of my forefathers with nothing but painful memories. This is modern Israel. This is modern Israel. Centuries of anti-Semitism. It is only in countries where you had large amounts of evangelical Christians where you did not have a history of anti-Semitism. The United States, it's much less. Holland, at one time, had a lot of believers, much less. Britain has had it, but again, less than most of the countries in continental Europe. It didn't matter where. France, Romania, Poland, Russia, Germany, obviously, the Muslim countries. We hate you, Jew. In France, le Juif, the Jew what they did to Dreyfus. We don't want you in our country. In Romania, we don't want you in our country. Poland, we don't want you in our country. Spain, during the Inquisition, we don't want you in our country. But now, we don't want you in your own country either. <laughs> well, this is chosen? Everybody knows an Apache can't occupy Arizona. They're the indigenous people. I have no problem with Euro-Americans or Afro-Americans or Asian-Americans or Hispanic-Americans living in Arizona. I have no problem with them living there. But don't tell me an Apache is an occupying presence. Don't tell me an Eskimo can occupy Alaska. Don't tell me a Maori can occupy New Zealand. They were there first. By definition... An indigenous native people verified by history, scripture, and archaeology to be the indigenous native people cannot be called an occupying presence unless they're a Jew. <laughs> unless they're a Jew. Under Barack Obama, the United States set a precedent voting against Israel, in basically in the United Nations for UNESCO. The Jews have no claim to the Wailing Wall, to Jerusalem, to any biblical mandated places in, in that land, says the United Nations. And that was very much the position of Barack Obama. Uh, he actually called prime ministers of other countries like Great Britain and Australia, and told them to vote against Israel and the UN. That, that's what happened. Um, we're chosen. They don't want us in their own country, and they don't want us in our own country. <laughs> My family was murdered. My wife came from Romania. She grew up under the communists. The communists persecuted the Jews under Ceausescu. Then, before that, there was the Holocaust. Most of my wife's family was murdered in the Holocaust. Most of them were killed in the Holocaust. You ask my wife's mother or father, what is Christianity? They'll tell you. Christianity is Jewish people being thrown and Jewish children being thrown into an oven in the name of Jesus Christ. That's Christianity to them. That's how they think of it. They think about the Holocaust, they think about the Crusades, they think about the Spanish Inquisition. Christians hate us! It obscures the fact that Jesus himself is Jewish, that the writers of the New Testament were all Jewish. That, that, that doesn't matter. That's the mentality of a Jew. We're cursed. We're, we're, we're chosen for this. What are we chosen for? This is what we're chosen for? It's horrible. That's the way they think. The nation Israel was reborn out of this kind of a climate. This is what happened. Well, that's the way Naomi thinks. Don't call me Naomi. 
call me Meta. I'm embittered. All our people have known, all my family has known, is centuries of hatred. Now, of course, this is the curse of the law. It's Leviticus 26, it's Deuteronomy 28. If you reject the Messiah, I will give you into the hands of your enemies. <laughs> it's the curse of the Torah. Now, God will judge those nations who oppress Israel. He will judge those nations, according to Genesis 12, 1 to 3. He will judge those nations, but he still allows those nations to afflict Israel as a ramification of abandoning his protection. They abandoned his protection. You have to understand this. Anti-Semitism and persecution of the church go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Abraham has two kinds of descendants. The descendants by birth and the descendants by second birth. There's the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by birth, genetic Jews, anthropological Jews, and modern mitochondrial DNA confirms that they are that ancient people. And you've got those who are his children, descendants by second birth. Abraham was a Gentile. God converted to Judaism. The seed, the Messiah, was to come from the woman. Jesus said salvation comes from the Jews. The scriptures come through the Jews. Therefore, the serpent wants to destroy them. This ultimately climaxes in Revelation chapter 12. Satan has always tried to destroy the woman in order to prevent her seed from coming. Remember Herod tried to kill Jesus coming out of Mary? Goes back to Genesis 3. Anti-Semitism and persecution of the true church are heads and tails. They are two sides of the same coin. Who did the ancient Romans persecute the most? If you read Josephus. Jews, born-again Christians. In the Inquisitions over the centuries in Europe, who did the Roman Catholic Church persecute the most? Jews, born-again Christians. Before the Iron Curtain came down, who did the Soviets persecute the most? Jews, born-again Christians. Who does Islam hate the most? Jews and Christians. We can and need to distinguish between anti-Semitism and persecution of the church the way we distinguish between heads and tails. But we cannot separate them. It all goes back to Genesis 3. Why didn't you choose somebody else? They're under the curse of the law. They rejected the Messiah. But as Paul writes in Romans 11, for the sake of their fathers, they still remain beloved. God still has a prophetic destiny for them. No matter what anyone tells you, three times, three times Jesus himself made it clear the Jews would return to that land. He said so in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trampled under the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. He said so. Okay. Zechariah 12, 10, for him to return, the Jews must be in Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 39, Jews must be in Jerusalem. The Jews must be back in that nation and back in Jerusalem as their capital. The spiritual battle you see today is manifested politically. The real issue is not the West Bank or the Golan Heights or the Gaza Strip. The real issue is the final status of Jerusalem. This has to do with the prophecies of Daniel and of Revelation being trampled under the feet of the Gentiles. Okay, this is what is happening. It's the most disputed piece of real estate in history. It's where the millennial temple of Jesus is going to exist. Satan must try to destroy the Jews and the Jewish nation. He must try to displace them from Jerusalem. He must. If he can use the United Nothing, or if he can use the European Union, or the Arab League, or the World Council of Churches, he will do it. 
And now we have anti-Israel evangelicals, they say. So they say, well, they talk about things like Palestinian rights. In 1968, King Hussein of Jordan, who I met in Virginia when I was 15, said, Jordan is Palestine. In 1970, after Black September, Yasser Arafat said, Palestine is Jordan. There is a Palestinian state, Jordan. 70% of the population of Jordan is Palestinian Arab. About 30, 25 to 30% are Bedouins. With the League of Nations, Jordan was Palestine after World War I. When the UN voted for the partition, Jordan was Palestine. When the British government gave up the mandate, Jordan was Palestine. Well, there is a Palestinian state called Jordan. Who said so? Yasser Arafat, the Jordanian government, the United Nations, the League of Nations, the British government. But then came the tooth fairy. One day in the 1970s, after Arafat tried to take over Jordan and was defeated by the British-trained Jordanian Legion in what's known as Black September, the Jordanians killed between 12, 12 and 15, no, between 15 and 18,000 of Arafat's gunmen in 12 days. <laughs> the tooth fairy came and waved a magic wand. And people in the West Bank went to sleep as Jordanians. But they woke up the next day, and they were Palestinians. <laughs> Ultimate revisionism. Complete nonsense. You've taken the Palestinian land. No, they didn't. There's never been any nation, Palestine, except for Jordan. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Who would say a Seminole does not have a right to live in Florida? Or an Apache does not have a right to live in Arizona? Who would say that? Nobody. They were there first. The archaeological record verifies the biblical history. They were there first. The Arabs were invaders who invaded the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines got it from the Romans. Romans got it from the Jews. And Isaiah tells us twice the nation Israel would be reborn. Once after the Babylonian captivity and once at the end of the age, and it is. But the Jews are like Ruth. Call me Mara. They rounded up the Jews in the town where my wife lived and shot most of her family. The Romanian Orthodox Church supported it, supported the pogroms, said they were Christian. Really happened. Really happened. Adolf Hitler came to power initially, democratically, in an election, made a coalition with the Centrum, the Catholic Party of Bavaria, Hans von Papen. They wanted to hang him at Nuremberg, but Pope Pius XII intervened. So they locked him up for eight years. That's how Hitler got power in a coalition government with the Catholic Party of Bavaria. Everybody knows it. But let's look. She's got two daughters, Moabites. Now going back to the Torah, the Moabites wouldn't let the Children of Israel passed through their land peaceably. The Moabites were not a liked people. They were a greatly disliked people. Conditions became so bad during a famine that Jews fled into Moab. She's there 10 years. And intermarry with Moabites. Quite a thing. Two daughters. Her sons are dead. Not only her husband, but both of her sons, Machlon and Kilion. She's got Opa, and she's got Ruth. Every Gentile, 
every Gentile church will either be in the character of Orpah or the character of Ruth. The true church, the true bride of Christ will say, the only God's the God of Israel. The one true God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The only scriptures are the Judeo-Christian scriptures. The Gospels, the epistles are written by Jews. Jesus is Jewish. Mary was Jewish. The apostles are Jewish. Salvation comes from the Jews, Jesus said. Oh, your people will be my people because your God will be my God. That's Ruth. Then there's Orpah. She wants to be friendly and polite and everything, but she's politically correct and joins the World Council of Churches. So it continues. But Naomi's got this idea. The Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Call me Mara. Call me Mary. That's the name. Marie, Maria, Mary comes from the Hebrew word bitter. All right. And she comes to a place called the House of Bread in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Bet, house is by it. Bet Lechem. The house of bread. Jesus, of course, is the bread of life. It's the city of David. That's chapter one. That's the background. Let's see what happens next. Can somebody nice and loudly please read chapter two? And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean the ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find bread. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reaper, and her half was to the right on the part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of the women. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reaper, The Lord be with you, and they answered, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant, that was said over the reapers, whose damsel is this? And the servant that was over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabite's damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the trees. So she came and continued even from the morning until now. And she carried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from here, but abide here, fast by, by my maids. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men that they should not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, Go to the vessel to the great vessel which the young man had drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself on the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It has been fully shown to me all that you have done unto thy mother in law since the death of thy husband. And how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy birth, and there are come unto a people which thou knowest not here for. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. For that thou hast comforted me, and for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I not be like one of thine own handmaids. And Boaz said unto her, And be a come, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, 
and reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficient, and left. And she was risen up to glean. Boaz commanded his young men, say, Let her glean among these, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of those handfuls of purpose for her. Leave them, that she may glean them, and don't rebuke her. And she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out that which she had gleaned, and it was about an epoch of barley. And she took it up, and went into the city, and to her mother-in-law, saw that she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave her that she had reserved after she was filled. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned to this day? And where brought us that? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee, and show her mother-in-law to whom she had brought, and said, This man's name with whom I have brought to this day is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her, Daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord, who has not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabite said, He said unto me, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my heart. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou hast to go out with his maid, and that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maid of Boaz, to glean at the end of the barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt there with her mother in law. <coughs> Quite a story. Jews were not to harvest the corners of their fields. Jesus said, The poor will always be with you. However, God did not want anybody to be impoverished. Even sojourners, even Gentiles, were not to go hungry. They didn't have a welfare state, but they did have provision for the poor. You would not harvest the corners of your fields. That was there for the disenfranchised, for the sojourner. That was there to make sure no one went hungry. You couldn't harvest it. It was like a charitable, con mandatory charitable contribution to feed the poor. He sees her going to the corners of the field. This rather wealthy gentleman, well, very wealthy gentleman, called Boaz. Boaz in Hebrew means in his strength, in his strength. And it's the name of one of the two pillars of the temple. Yaakin, Yahweh shall establish, and Boaz in his strength. He shall establish the temple in his strength. Of course, these things have typological meanings. Um, remember Jesus said, I'll make you a temple, and the, a pillar in the temple of my God. <laughs> It'll be established in his strength. Um, separate subject, I only mentioned it briefly in passing, but it relates to that. Boaz, a name of one of the pillars. In his strength. And he is related to the deceased husband, Elimelech, which means, my father is king. Elimelech, my father is king of the woman who wants to be called Mary, Naomi. Oh, man, I, I heard about this. I mean, she, she, she's a Gentile woman. She's even a Moabitess. But she was kind to Jewish people and even to my family. I know about her. I remember in Israel, I lived on a kibbutz, kind of a agricultural cooperative. And there'd be volunteers coming there to learn Hebrew and to learn agricultural skills, mainly young people, like with a year off from college or something like that. And they'd come from different countries, you know. Where are you from? Australia. Where are you from? You know, Venezuela. Where are you from? You know, Canada. Where are you from? Holland. Oh, Holland. That's where Corey Ten Boom was from. Where are you from? Denmark. Oh, Denmark. When the Nazis wanted to arrest the Jews, all the Jews were ordered to wear gold stars. The king of Denmark, 
King Christian, who really was a Christian, put on a yellow star and he told all the Danish people to wear yellow stars so the Nazis would know who to arrest. It goes back to Genesis 12, 1 to 3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Mark my words. This is not political. It's simply a theological statement. The judgment of God would have fallen on the United States a long time ago. Because of the genocidal atrocities of abortion, because of the general godlessness of society. But the United States still spends three out of every five dollars given to missions and evangelism and Christian charity still comes from the USA. Our own ministry would collapse almost without the USA. And we take care of kids in the Philippines and India and so forth. That's one reason. Second reason, you got a president who moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Satan raised up a man who tried to turn America against Israel. But praying Christians had an influence. I'll bless them that bless thee. You see how good the economy is doing in all this? I'm not saying it's exactly cause and effect, but it is a factor. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. You look at history. Britannia ruled the waves. Made one big mistake when it revoked the Bellflower Declaration. After promising the Jews could go back to their land, after World War I, the British revoked the Bellflower Declaration. So the Jews burned. Here comes the Luftwaffe. So did London. So did Liverpool. So did Coventry. Britannia no longer rules the waves. The sun never set on the British Empire. Now it sets on the British Empire every 24 hours. At one time, I live in London. At one time, at one time, Spain was the superpower. The Spanish main controlled most of the New World. Even this country, California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, the conquistadors like the Soto and these guys in Cormado, this is this. All of Mexico, Central America, and most of South America apart from Brazil which was Portuguese, that was Spain, plus other stuff. Until the Inquisition. Then Francis Drake sunk the Armada. Bye-bye, Spain. The Deutschland, the Fatherland. Germany is the cultural capital of Europe. They built a wall around the Jewish ghettos. And any Jew climbing over that wall was machine gunned. So a wall was built around Berlin, the capital of the Reich, and any German climbing over that wall was machine gunned. Not until Hermann Hesse, the last Nazi responsible for the Holocaust and the Blitz, died in Spando prison. Not until he was dead. Within two weeks later, that wall came down. Anybody who has persecuted the true church or who has persecuted the Jews has touched the apple of God's eye and they come under his judgment. He may allow it to happen. He may allow the persecution to correct his people or his children, but they're still his people and his children. You've touched the apple of his eye. Nobody gets away with that. You mess with Abraham's children by faith or Abraham's children by genes. <laughs> Their father is coming after you. Praise God. Praise. Nobody's ever gotten away with this. You go back to the ancient empire, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, they all persecuted the Jews. Where are they now? But that little nation is still there. 
It's not because of them. It's not because of them. It's because of their God. My family are Israeli Jewish. My children are born in Galilee. There's nothing special about Jews. But there's something very special about the God of the Jews. About the Messiah of the Jews. About the book of the Jews. About the covenants with the Jews. Remember, the new covenant was made not with the church. Jesus, God, never made a covenant with the church. Look, please, to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the one I made with their fathers. With whom was the new covenant made? The Vatican? No. The World Council of Churches? No. The Presbyterians? No. The church has no covenant of its own. The new covenant is made with Israel and the Jews. Look at Romans chapter 9. Verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom belongs present continuous active still belongs to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants in Greek diathiki plural not just the old the old and the new Jesus inaugurated the new covenant at a paschal seder a passover meal was the last supper the church has no covenant of its own. Non-Jews who believe in Jesus through the second birth are grafted in to a covenant made with the Jews. If God is finished with Israel, he's automatically finished with the church because the church has no covenant. God never made a covenant with the church. Your people be my people. Because your God's my God. Where you go, I'm going to go. You understand? Do not believe replacement theology. Supersessionism. It is a lie of the devil. And do not believe that contemporary events in the Middle East do not fulfill prophecy. They absolutely do. But let's continue. So she's gleaning the corners of the fields. She's picking up her welfare check. She's on a dole. She's getting her pittance. But she blessed Israel. And so Boaz, the boss, says, What are you doing? Get her over here. I don't want you on welfare. I'm going to give you a good living. Don't glean from the corners. You go out with my servants and you harvest in the fields and you pick the good grain, the good rich grain from the fields the same as my servants. Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. Boaz commands his servant, don't touch her. What does Paul say? Don't make them get circumcised, leave them alone. They're as good as we are. We're one unto salvation. But now let's look a bit further. Verse 5. 
It's good that you go out. She stayed close to the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest. Well, this is like it. Bringing in the sheaves. What a wonderful hymn. You know, this is... This, I'd love it if we could sing it at the end, if somebody can play it. I don't know if you guys... It's an old-time gospel song that used to be sung here in the American South, bringing in the sheaves. This is the harvest season. Well, let's read chapter 3 now. Nice and loudly, chapter 3. He will not rest until he has settled it today. To understand this, we have to understand certain inclusions in the Torah, in Jewish law, to make sense of this. There were certain maladies, certain maladies, infirmities, birth defects in ancient Israel that would have been interpreted, sometimes misinterpreted, as a divine curse. For instance, in the ancient Near East, literacy was in every other culture the reserve of the aristocracy, the nobility, royalty, military commanders, pag pagan priesthoods, things like that. The Jews, not so. The Levites had to make sure every Jew could read the Torah and was numerate. A Jew had to be literate and numerate in order to practice their faith. To this day, education is very highly emphasized in the Jewish community. I told my children, I said like this, it's your life, it's your future, I can't live your life for you, you have to make your own decisions. So here's the way it is. After college, I could put you through law school, I could put you through medical school, I could put you through dental school, or I can put you through the wall. Now what's it going to be? <laughs> As I said, they're both Jewish lawyers and they want to sue me for damages. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. It goes back to this. Education was always, always emphasized. And its roots go back in large part to the Torah. 
Well, let's understand this. Remember the bam, man born blind, the John line, who sinned him or his parents? Well, he can't read the Torah. He was excluded from the community of worship. It was seen as a divine curse. Now, Jesus said it wasn't, but that's how they misinterpreted it. Okay. Another was uh, infertility. Female infertility, male impotency. Remember, if, if a male suffered crushed genitals or something like this, <laughs> People are born biologically to reproduce because we are born again to reproduce. It is a obviously an Old Testament type of, of New Testament faith, but it was there. Now, if a female suffered infertility, it was seen as a divine curse for a couple of reasons. One of which was in certain tribes, particularly Judah and the tribe of uh, Levi, the identity of the priests and the high priests and the king would be determined by succession, by pedigree. You had to know who the right king was, who the right priest was going to be from the tribe of Judah and from the tribe of Levi, there was that. But there was something called Yerusha, inheritance. The land was the Lord's. It had to stay in the same tribes, clans, and families according to the apportionment of Joshua. You could not have a mortgage foreclosure that was permanent. If you went to the wall financially and you were broke and you lost your land, it would be repatriated to you or to your family in the year of Jubilee. You understand? A bank couldn't take it. A creditor couldn't take it permanently. They could take it and use it agriculturally to regain what you owed them, but in the year of Jubilee, it would go back to you. You could not be permanently, or a family could not be permanently dispossessed. It was Yerusha, Yerusha. But there was another aspect. Honor thy father and mother. We think of that in terms of being respectful to parents and things, and it entails that, but that's not the main meaning. In Greek, in the Septuagint, honor, honorarium, has to do with money. The same as your parents were financially responsible for you or for me, for us, in our pediatric years, should the need emerge, we are financially responsible for them in their geriatric years. Remember Jesus rebuked the religious hypocrites? Anything that to be helped my parents is korban given to God? <laughs> this is a commandment with a promise reiterated in the New Testament. You don't take care of aged parents. Don't expect to be aged yourself. It'll affect your own longevity. <laughs> That's the New Testament. It was a big deal. But what happened? Your, your child, much like the third world today, your child is your pension. You understand? You don't have a child, particularly if you don't have a son. You're in trouble. You're socioeconomically displaced. You're going to be an old lady or gleaning in the corners of the fields. An old lady living in a tenement on welfare or something like that, in a housing project. In. That's what it's going to be. Your child was your provision. If you didn't have a child, you had a problem. So it got so serious to God. It was so serious to God. He provided for something called Leverite marriage. Leverite marriage is a way one of the ways that we account for the apparent discrepancies between the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and the genealogy in Luke. When they don't coincide, one of the factors is Leverite marriage. It works like this. If your brother dies and he has a widow, in order to provide for her and perpetuate the name of your brother, Jews to this day will name their children after a deceased ancestor or relative. Perpetuate the name. You would procreate a child on behalf of your brother by impregnating his widow. But legally, the child would be his, not yours. Okay? Now the reason for this was to preserve the Yerusha and to take care of the widow in her old age in this ancient agricultural economy. Okay. Much like the gleaning of the corners of the fields, God always had some kind of a legal provision 
Okay, you're going to have poor people, but you're not going to have impoverished people. Turn with me, please, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25. Verse 5, when brothers live together and one of them dies, has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. In other words, impregnate her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that the name of his brother will not be blotted out from Israel. Now again, this is Old Testament typology. Jews who died under the law in the Old Testament before Jesus came were reliant on another Jew, one of their brothers, to come after they were dead and redeem their name to keep it in the book of life. You understand? It's, it's a typological of the Messiah. Does everybody understand? They were reliant on another Jew to come and redeem their name, those who died faithful to God under the law. Well, let's continue. Verse 7. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then this brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders, it's like the city council, town council, and say, my, brother, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and say, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him on the side of the elders, pull off his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall declare, thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal was removed. Well, there's a lot to this. The only form of birth control that existed in the ancient world, obviously, was coitus interruptus, ex-vaginal ejaculation. It was allowed for the Hebrews, but not in a Leverite marriage. You were not to use your brother's widow for purely sexual purposes. She was not to be treated like a sexual concubine or a sex object. The impregnation was, so your brother's name would not be blotted out, so the Yerusha would be preserved, and so she would be taken care of in her old age, and the apportionment going back to Joshua would continue. You understand? You are not to use her as just a sexual object. You could not practice birth control as birth control was then. In that situation, it had to be specific, looking to procreate a child on behalf of your deceased brother, who would legally be your deceased brother's child for all legal purposes. Okay? Now, if you didn't want to marry her, the sandal would be pull, pulled from your foot in a public ritual, and she would spit in your face. It was a thing of dishonor. Okay? Well, that's love a right marriage. Now, let's look at an example of Leverite marriage. Turn with me very briefly to Genesis 38. Same tribe as Boaz. It came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son and named him Er. Then she conceived again and bore a son named Onan. She bore still another son and named him Shela, or Shelach, which means sent, and it was at Kezib that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for his firstborn, Er, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Now she's left a widow because her husband was no good. The Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty as a brother-in-law to her, 
and raise up offspring for your brother. Have a love right marriage, as Moses would later legally frame it. Okay? But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. The baby would legally be his brother's. He wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. In other words, he practiced birth control. It was just a sexual thing. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. So he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. She's waiting for this little kid to get old enough <laughs> to take her on a date. <laughs> and she's not getting any younger. <laughs> quite a story, isn't it? It's quite a story. <laughs> So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to the sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And it was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear the sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enaim which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. In other words, she got dressed up the way a prostitute would have dressed in those days. Okay? With the Greek, it was the Hamos, Gamos, they used cosmetics and hairstyles and things like that. That's why Peter says, don't do that only. Well, in Song of Solomon, it was not wrong for a Jewish bride to use cosmetics. The uniform of a prostitute or a harlot in the Jewish culture was different than the Greek culture. In the Greek culture, it was the gaudy makeup and the coffee and all this stuff. Well, in Jewish culture, it was to put a, a covering over your face. That was that was how they knew you were on the game or the street walk or whatever they called them in those days. So there it goes. She does this. She pretends to be a prostitute. And she couldn't obviously, rec he couldn't recognize her. Her face was covered. <laughs> that tells you something about the Islamic halabja, doesn't it? So he turned aside to her by the road and said, here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that you may come in to me? Like a prostitute, she negotiates a price. And he said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? And he said, what pledge will I give you? She said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her. And she conceived the son. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. And the young goat comes, but the son is born. His name is Pettitz. So she has a baby with a much older man. Okay? She has a baby with a much older man. Now, this is in the genealogy of Jesus. <laughs> Just think about it. Jesus has two Gentile women in his ancestry. Moab, he has the Moabite as Ruth, but he also has Rahab. He actually has two prostitutes in his genealogy. Let me tell you about my family tree. My great-great-grandmother's great-great-grandmother was a hooker, you know. The only one of us who could have chosen his ancestry <laughs> has Gentile women <laughs> and hookers to boot <laughs> in his bloodline. Now, there's reasons for that. He's the salvation of Jew and Gentile and things like this. 
Okay. People may be born out of whoredom, but when they're born again, it doesn't matter. They're in the bloodline of the Messiah and things like this. There's typological reasons for these things. Perhaps some other time we can look at the genealogies. But this takes place in the tribe of Judah. So let's go back to Ruth. He doesn't want to marry her. He's obviously, spits in his face, pulls off the sandal. Be no love right marriage. The other one practices birth control. Cordis interrupts us, that's it. God judges it. Well, this is a love right marriage. So Naomi begins to think, well, he might be older gentleman, but he's a very nice man and he's a person of means. He'll know how to take care of you. You're a daughter to me. You've become a daughter to me. He'll take care of you. This is what we call in Jewish culture, Jewish culture, European Jewish culture is called Yiddishkeit. And in Yiddishkeit, this is called the Yiddish Mama. A Yiddish Mama is always concerned for who her daughter marries. There was a silly song when I was a little boy in New York. Didn't like it much. I thought it was kind of for nerds. But it was, Que sera, sera. Will I be happy? Will I be rich? I asked my mother, here's what she said to me. And then, yeah, whatever it will be, will be. Well, a Yiddish mama would never sing that. A Yiddish mama would say, Que sera, shmera. Listen to your mother. <laughs> You're going to marry a lawyer like your cousin Ruben? You're going to marry a maxillofacial surgeon like your Uncle Asher? You're going to move to Long Island? You're going to be happy? You're going to be rich? That's what she said to me. Kesera, <laughs> shmera. <laughs> The Jewish woman tells the Gentile woman how to get a rich Jewish husband. Salvation comes from the Jews. The only reason non-Jews have the gospel is because through the Jews, God gave it to them. Acts 10, Acts 28, Acts 13. But let's look. He gives her six sacks of grain. Take this grain to your mother-in-law. She's not had it in a long time. He says to the Gentile woman, take the grain and give it to the Jewish woman. As we looked at yesterday, what is the grain a picture of in Scripture? the word of God. The same as God used the Jews to evangelize the non-Jews in the beginning of the church. In the last days, when the natural branches get grafted in again, God uses the Gentiles to re-evangelize the Jews. Most Jews who are saved have been led to the Lord by non-Jews. Most of the, non, of the Jews who've been saved have been led to the Lord by non-Jews. I know Jewish people who've been saved because Gentile Christians prayed for them for years. Most of the support for Jewish missions and evangelism comes from Gentile Christians and Gentile churches. Our own ministry, Moriel, although it's expanded to a lot of other things in the third world, began as a Jewish mission, and we still evangelize Jews. We have a branch in Israel. You'll find material on our website for evangelizing Jews and so forth. Give them the grain. Be careful of organizations, churches, and ministries who do not believe in evangelizing Jews, who are ecumenical, or who don't. They're not evangelizing Catholics, they're not evangelizing Mormons now, and they're not evangelizing Jews. This is not the love of Jesus. This is not the love of Jesus. Give them the grain. They need their Messiah. Story continues. She begins to think, I got to fix you up with this guy. He's related to me. You've met him. It won't be a blind date. 
listen to me. Here's what we're going to do. Well, let's see how this happy story gets really happy. Can somebody please, nice and loudly, read the final chapter, chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to, the, up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. And so he said, turn aside, friend, and sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may help, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day by the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, because I have jeopardized my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself, and you may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times of Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of lands to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of my of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said, relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilean and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez and Tamar, born to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor of women came, gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron. And to Hezron was born Ram. And to Ram, Amidabah. And to Amidabah was born Nashon. And to Nashon, Sam. And to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse David. Well, in chapter 3, they have their first date. And she, well, it's a strange custom, but she lays down next to him and uncovers his feet. And he says, boy, this fancy young chick digs me, and I'm an old man. <laughs> Must have stood up his testosterone levels and got him going. <laughs> and he was attracted. <laughs> Found attractive by this young young woman. Here we are. Yes, sir. Down the lover's lane with Cindy Lou hopping the back seat of a 58 Chevy. I said, listen, no. She said, I can't do that. I said, why not? Well, I got a relative closer to me. You got to marry her. <laughs> It was something like that. 
So this other guy has the right of redemption because he was a closer blood kinsman. Now, with this would have come the house, the farm, all the properties that belong to the sons and to the father. That we said the Yerusha. And this other relative is not named. Notice his name is not there. His name is not redeemed. You want the inheritance, the promise? Yeah. Well, you have to marry the widow. I can't do that. The inheritance I want. The heritage of my fathers I want. The house I want, the farm I want, the blessing I want. But I don't want anything to do with that shiksa, that Gentile woman. Salvation came from the Jews, but now it's the Gentile church who has the message of salvation. Doesn't want it. I know a case where this happened. It was in England. A prominent Jewish family had a son, Samuels, and they uh, owned the largest, the single largest chain, it was one of the two biggest chains of jewelry stores in Great Britain. And one of, and they were Orthodox Jews, and one of the sons became a believer. And the inheritance was about 40 million British pounds, at that time about 65 million US dollars. Today's money, it would have been well over 100 million, well over. And he was disinherited and bequeathed because he believed in Jesus. He didn't get a sixpence, he didn't get a dime, but he got eternal life. <laughs> you can't buy eternal life even with $65 million. story continues. I can't redeem it. I jeopardized my own inheritance. My family would disown me if I became a Christian. <laughs> In verse 6. Redeem it yourself. You can have it. I can't redeem it. So... Here they go under the hoop where they're going to have the wedding. Boaz said to the elders, you are my witnesses today. I bought from the hand of Naomi all that belongs to Elimelech and belongs to Chilion and Machron. I've acquired Ruth and Moabitus. He gets her and they say, we're the witnesses. Now look what the people say. All the people in the court in verse 11 were witnesses. Anaknu Edim. The Adim, the witnesses, are really important. Like in the Song of Solomon, the Seva Oath of Shemaim that sing the choruses are the witnesses to the romance between Solomon and Shulamit. It's got to be witnesses. Convocation. The wedding has to be a convocation. Well, let's look. Typologically, it prefigures the marriage supper of the Lamb. But again, that's just something I mentioned in passing. Perhaps we'll explain Jewish wedding at a future visit or something. But let's look now. We're witnesses, and may the Lord make the woman who's coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah. Remember? Rachel and Leah. Jacob comes, and he desires Rachel. Can't get Rachel. First, he has to get Leah. He falls in love with Leah. Initially, it's Leah having all the babies, laying the foundation for the 12 tribes of Israel in Genesis 49. It's Leah. But then, he gets Rachel. Finally, Rachel becomes, as it were, maternally fruitful. May you be like that. Both of whom built the house of Israel. Jesus comes for a bride from his own people. Doesn't get him. It's another bride. 
initially this other bride who he falls in love with is the most fruitful. Has all the babies through second birth. But then all Israel shall be saved. Then he gets the bride he came for. Both of whom, both of whom built the house. You understand? What does it say next? May you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez and Tamar. Genesis 38, Matthew chapter 1. Remember, Tamar is impregnated by the older man. Have a right marriage. The eligible son doesn't want her. The old man does. Let's look. May you be like, your house be like the house of Pettis, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Now the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. May he become famous in Israel. Redeemer, Goel, the one who buys back. Now, can anybody think of the baby born in Bethlehem who's famous and who's the redeemer and buys us back? This is Jesus in the Old Testament. The Lord enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer. May his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, and it's better to you than seven sons, has given birth. And this begins the line of David. The royal line of Israel. The regal Genealogy, the house of David, Bet David, union between a Jew and a Gentile that would produce David, and from David would come the Messiah, born in Bethlehem, who would be the redeemer of both Jew and Gentile, but it had to be a union of Jew and Gentile. <laughs> And they take the baby and they gave the baby to Naomi. Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer. May he be a restorer to life in you. This is your baby. This is a Jewish baby. He's born in Bethlehem. He's your redeemer. The Gentile bride, the Gentile woman, better to her than seven daughters. You gave me the Redeemer. My own from Bethlehem. And such begins Matthew 1. This is Matthew 0. <laughs> as I call it. Well, what else do we see? The shortest Ishai, Jesus is the root of Jesse. It all begins here. These are the generations of Pedas. From Pedas was born his Ram. As we looked at in Genesis 38, his Ram was born Ram, and to Ram Aminadab, Aminadab born Nachshon, Nachshon, Salmon. Salmon was born Boaz, Boaz, Obed, and Obed was born Jesse, and Jesse, David. 
David, Melech, Israel, the royal house of David. It goes back to this. So this woman says, my name is no longer Naomi. My name is Mary. And she's in Bethlehem. And she gets a baby. Here, Mary. And at that moment, her bitterness is taken away. When a Jewish person comes to faith in Yeshua the Messiah, when a natural branch is grafted in again, the devil gets very angry. Salvation is a wonderful thing, a beautiful thing for anybody of any race or any nation to be saved. But when a natural branch gets grafted in again, it's Romans 11. In the last days, they will be grafted in again, and they are being grafted in again. The American College of Rabbis, the American College of Rabbis admits more Jews have been saved in the last 18 years than in the last 18 centuries. My children growing up in Israel as little kids were saying to their grandparents in Hebrew, why don't you believe in our Messiah, Yeshua, saying that to their Holocaust surviving grandparents. I'll tell you a true story. Took away the grief, took away the bitterness. A restorer. I knew a man named Gershom. I know him pretty well. In Haifa, Israel. He was a Holocaust survivor. But his wife and his five children did not survive. Five of them. And his dear wife. Neither did his parents or any of his siblings except, I think, one sister. And she died. It was just this old Jewish watchmaker. Gershom. And he knew a believer. She was kind of a strange person, but she was a believer. And she used to bring him to our meetings. And we were having meetings, and he would come, and he was nice, and we would talk to him, we'd try to witness to him. But that man had no tears left to cry. All he had was an old, tarnished, black-and-white photo of his wife and five children who the Nazis murdered in the name of Jesus Christ. That's all he had. They put his babies into ovens, the gas chambers. And he's coming and we prayed for him, and we prayed for him, and we prayed for him. And one night, the gospel was preached on a Friday night. And he stood up and began crying after reading or after hearing the crucifixion. Preached, the gospel was preached from the crucifixion. And uh, he said, I didn't believe there could be, ever be a Jew who suffered more than I did. <laughs> he said, but Yeshua, Jesus, Suffered more than I did. Not might he accepted Jesus as his Messiah. He's with the Lord now. It's Christian. Because the Gentile Christians, there were some missionaries who had been missionaries in Indonesia, witnessed to him and loved him and prayed for him. <laughs> and they, they had come to Israel and they gave him the baby born in Bethlehem. I've seen it happen, and it still happens. Meta, bitter. It all depends on God's plan. Your salvation depended on God's plan for Israel and the Jews. Your salvation, my sal, our salvation depended on God's plan for Israel. Now Israel's salvation depends on God's plan for you. That Gentile woman who's better than seven daughters. As a man with a Jewish family, I appeal to you for your prayers for the salvation of Israel. My dear brethren in Jesus, that Gentile woman is you. God bless. Thank you for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.